This presentation addresses provisions in the American Institute of Steel Construction specification for structural steel buildings that apply to tension members. This will include a discussion of strength and serviceability limits, such as gross section yielding and net section fracture, the calculation of net areas, and the determination of the shear lag reduction coefficient. Chapter D of the AISC specification addresses tension members. That chapter includes six sections and we'll discuss those sections that are underlined here. The first section, section D1, includes a recommended serviceability limit on the slenderness of a member. While there isn't a hard limit, there is a recommendation that says that the slenderness, L over R, preferably should not exceed 300, where L is the length of the member and R is the radius of gyration. Slender members are more susceptible to inadvertent damage during fabrication, transport, and erection, and slender members are susceptible to vibrations when excited by wind, vibrating mechanical equipment or HVAC units, or even by normal use of the structure. Section D2 addresses the strength of tension members, and the first of the two strength limit states is gross section yielding, or tension yielding, as it's known in the AISC specification. The nominal strength, P sub n, associated with a tension yielding failure is calculated as F sub y times A sub g, where F sub y is the yield stress of the steel, and A sub g is the gross area of the section. If load and resistance factor design is being used, then the available strength, or the design strength, phi times P sub n, is calculated by multiplying the nominal strength, P sub n, by the resistance factor of phi equals 0 0.9. If allowable stress design is being used, then the available strength, or the allowable strength, P sub n over omega, is calculated by dividing the nominal strength, P sub n, by the safety factor of omega equals 1.67, or 5 thirds. Yielding in the member on the gross section is considered a limit state because it could lead to excessive elongation of the member that could compromise the stability or the safety of the structure. The second strength limit state for a tension member is that of a net section fracture or tensile rupture, as it's known in the AISC specification. The nominal strength, P sub n, associated with a tensile rupture failure is calculated as F sub u times A sub e, where F sub u is the tensile stress of the steel and A sub e is the effective net area of the section, calculated as the product of the shear lag reduction coefficient u and the net area A sub n. If the load and resistance factor design philosophy is being used, then the available strength or design strength phi times P sub n is calculated by multiplying the nominal strength P sub n by the resistance factor of phi equals 0.75. And if the allowable stress design philosophy is being used, then the available strength or the allowable strength P sub n divided by omega is calculated by dividing the nominal strength P sub n by the safety factor of omega equals 2.0. Rupture or fracture of the member is considered a limit state because when this failure occurs, the member is no longer able to carry any load. I know that the focus of this class is structural steel buildings, but this pony truss bridge is a good example to illustrate the difference between a gross section and a net section since the structure is exposed. If we zoom in on one of the members of that bridge, then we can show that the portion of the member between the connection at its ends is called the gross section of the member. The gross area A sub G of the member is the area of this cross section and is defined in the AISC specification simply as the total cross sectional area. The net section in contrast is a section that is cut at the ends of the member where it is connected to the gusset plates. The net area A sub N of a member is defined by the AISC specification as the sum of the products of the thickness and the net width of each element of a section. In the case of a bolted connection like those shown here, the net section is generally cut through holes that were made to accommodate the bolts. We refer to it as the net section because generally you start off with a gross section, remove some of the material in the section to accommodate the bolts, and the remaining material is the net. The general expectation is that the distribution of stress on the gross section is approximately uniform. A rule of thumb that is often used is that the gross section of the member ends at a distance of about one and a half to two times the major dimension of the member away from the first row of bolts. So if the depth of the member is 12 inches, then the gross section would start 18 to 24 inches away from the ends of the connections. The stress distributions on this slide illustrate that idea. 
the idea that at the gross section, shown here on the right, the distribution of stress is approximately uniform. On the net section, however, shown here on the left, the distribution of stress is not uniform because the stress has to flow around the holes, resulting in concentrations of stress near the holes. These are distributions of elastic stress when the load is well below the strength of the member. As the magnitude of the force P increases, the peak stresses near the holes also increase until they reach the yield stress of the member. At this point, there will likely be minor yielding of the material of the connection, but yielding on the net section is not considered to be a limit state because it will be localized and will not lead to excessive elongation of the member. Yielding on the growth section is considered to be a limit state, however, because if the entire length of the member yields, then it would likely result in an, in an unacceptable elongation of the member. As the magnitude of the force P increases further, eventually the stress on the growth section will reach the yield stress F sub Y, or the stress on the net section will reach the tensile stress F sub U. While the stress on the net section was non-uniform at lower loads, at higher loads, the inherent ductility of the steel as a material allows the stress to redistribute until it is approximately uniform, at least for well-designed connections. The strength of the member associated with yielding on the growth section is taken as P sub N equals F sub Y times A sub G, while the strength of members like this associated with fracture or rupture on the net section is taken as P sub N equals F sub U times A sub N. The area of the net section is taken as the sum of the products of the net widths and the thicknesses of each of the elements in the section. Standard holes are fabricated 1 16th of an inch larger than the diameter of the bolt for bolts up to and including 7 8 inch in diameter, whereas standard holes are fabricated 1 8 of an inch larger than the diameter of the bolt for bolts 1 inch in diameter and larger. When calculating the net width of an element, the width of a bolt hole is taken as 1 16th of an inch larger than the nominal dimension of the hole to account for possible damage that may occur during the fabrication of the hole. The word dimension is used here with respect to the hole instead of diameter because there are several types of holes that are permitted, including standard holes, oversized holes, short slots, and long slots. Standard holes, abbreviated STD, provide a minimum amount of fit-up tolerance around the bolts. Oversized holes, abbreviated OVS, provide additional tolerance around the bolts in both directions relative to standard holes whereas short slots and long slots, abbreviated SSL and LSL respectively, provide additional fit-up tolerance in only one direction. Regardless of what type of hole is used, however, the effective diameter of the hole is equal to the actual diameter of the hole plus 1 16th of an inch. Table J3.3 of the AIC specification provides the dimensions of holes. If you look closely, you'll see that the tolerances provided are larger for bolts 1 inch in diameter and larger than they are for bolts 7 8 inch in diameter and smaller. Bear in mind, though, that if slots are used, that the orientation of the slot relative to the member is important, as in some cases you would deduct the width of the slot, and in other cases you would deduct the length of the slot in determining the net area. For all bolts though, regardless of diameter, the effective dimension of the hole is equal to the actual dimension of the hole plus 1 16th of an inch. Holes can be made by drilling, punching, or cutting using oxyacetylene torches, plasma torches, lasers, or even water jets. Drilled holes are permitted in all applications are in, and are required in many cases where the loading is cyclic or in most seismic designs. The hole shown here on the left was made by drilling, whereas the hole on the right was made by a water jet. The hole shown here on the left was made by plasma cutting, whereas the hole shown here on the right was made with a laser cutting method. And the two holes shown on this slide were both made with punching, with the hole on the left made with a relatively new punch and die, and the hole on the right made with a relatively worn punch and die. Written algebraically, the net area is taken as the sum of W sub n times T, where W sub n is the net width of each element and T is the element thickness. The net width of each element is taken as the gross width W sub G minus the sum of the effective hole diameters D effective. 
For bolt sizes up to and including 7 eighths of an inch, the effective diameter of a standard hole is taken equal to the diameter of the bolt plus 1 16th of an inch to get to the nominal diameter of the hole, plus an additional 16th of an inch to account for possible damage during the fabrication of the hole. For bolt sizes of one inch and larger, the effective diameter of a standard hole is equal to the diameter of the bolt plus an eighth of an inch to get to the nominal diameter of the hole, plus an additional sixteenth of an inch to account for possible damage during fabrication of the hole. When holes are offset or staggered like those shown on this slide, it is sometimes necessary to investigate fracture paths with diagonal segments. In those cases, the net area is determined by deducting the sum of the effective hole diameters from the gross width of the section and then adding the quantity S squared over 4G for each diagonal segment in the chain. S is the spacing of the segment measured parallel to the axis of the member, and G is the gauge measured perpendicular to the axis of the member. The next topic of our discussion is that of shear lag. We have the net area of the member A sub N and we have the effective net area of the member A sub E and the difference between the two is the shear lag reduction coefficient U. Shear lag is a concept that is used to account for non-uniform distributions of stresses in members where some of the elements of the section are connected but others are not. The term element in this case is used to refer to the flange of a W shape, the leg of an angle, the web of a channel, the stem of a T, etc. The shear lag coefficient is applied to the net area of members with bolted connections and is applied to the gross area of members with welded connections. Generally speaking, the shear lag effects are less severe in longer connections since there's more room in the connection for the redistribution of stress. In cases where all of the elements of a cross section are connected, then all of the elements are expected to be fully effective and the shear lag reduction coefficient is taken as one. In the case of the bar shown here, there is only one cross-sectional element. That element is bolted to the adjacent gusset plate, and thus U would be equal to 1.0. In other cases, like the case of this channel, for example, it wouldn't be uncommon for some of the cross-sectional elements to be connected and some to remain unconnected. In this case, the channel has three cross-sectional elements. The web of the channel is connected, but the two flanges are not. So in this case, and in cases like it, the unconnected elements won't be fully effective at the net section, and that needs to be accounted for in our calculations by using a shear lag reduction coefficient that is less than one. Consider the finite element model of a channel welded to a gusset plate shown here. When the channel is subjected to tension, the stress or force that is carried by the two flanges can't flow directly into the gusset plate. Instead, that stress has to make its way out of the flanges and into the web before it can be transferred into the gusset plate through the welts. In fact, if we zoom in a little bit, you can see the stress contours better. Red and orange colors indicate a higher stress than green, so you can see that there is a non-uniform distribution of stress that indicates that the flanges are not 100% effective at the net section because they aren't connected directly to the gusset plate. In cases like this, we would use a shear lag reduction coefficient to account for that effect. Since it is a reduction factor, U ranges between 0 and 1, but is typically in the range of 0 0.5 to 1.0. Generally, we look up the value of U in table D3.1 of the AISC specification. This table spans two pages in the specification, and there are a number of different cases that apply to different connection configurations. Case one is the default and its description reads, where tension is transmitted directly to each of the cross-sectional elements by fasteners or welds. This would apply to the case of a bar that is used in tension since in that case, there is only one cross-sectional element. That element is connected by fasteners or welds, so thus U is taken as one. Case two is probably the most useful of the cases in the table and applies to the general situation where tension is transmitted to some, but not all of the cross-sectional elements. In that case, you take U equal to one minus X bar over L, where L is the length of the connection and X bar is defined as a connection eccentricity. Case three applies to tension members that are connected using only transverse welds, and case four applies to tension members connected using only longitudinal welds.
Case 5 applies to hollow structural sections that are connected using a single concentric gusset plate that is fitted into a slot in the HSS. And Case 6 applies to hollow structural sections that are connected with two side gusset plates. Cases 7 and 8 are rather imprecise rules of thumb that are based on the proportions of the tension member's cross sections. These cases can be useful during design when you need to make a member selection, but you don't yet know the specifics of the connection, such as the connection length or the connection eccentricity. Let's take a closer look at case two, which is probably the most useful case, where u is taken as one minus x bar over l. For an angle bolted through one leg, as shown here, the member is made up of two elements and only one element is directly connected. Thus, case two can be applied. The length L is measured from the first bolt to the last bolt parallel to the applied load, and the connection eccentricity is measured from the fang surface on the connected leg to the centroid of the angle. A fang surface is a surface that is in contact with another component. So for this angle connected through its horizontal leg, this is the fang surface. For the case of a channel that's bolted through its web, the member is made up of three elements and only one element is directly connected. So case two can again be applied. The fang surface in this case is the back of the web, and x bar is taken as the perpendicular distance measured from that surface to the centroid of the channel. In some cases, like the case of the bridge that we showed earlier in this presentation, it isn't always easy to discern what the connection eccentricity is. In the case of that bridge, the trusses were made up of wide flange shapes that were bolted through their flanges, but not through their webs. In that case, you basically split the member along its axis and treat it like two T-sections, taking X-bar as is shown here. When we have the case of a W-shape that's bolted through its web instead of through its flanges, then we basically split the section in half along the plane of symmetry through the web and treat it like two channels that are arranged back to back. So in that case, we would have to compute the location of the centroid of that hypothetical channel cross-section and then take X-bar as a distance from the plane of symmetry to the centroid of the hypothetical channel. There's a useful table in the AISC Steel Construction Manual, Table 1-7A, that provides workable gauges for angles with various leg sizes. This table includes angle legs from 1 inch to 12 inches wide and is arranged with the dimension G shown for cases where only one bolt is required in a leg of an angle and dimensions G1, G2, G3, and G4 for cases where two or more bolts are required in a leg. For example, a 4 inch angle leg would be able to accommodate only one bolt and that bolt would be spaced 2.5 inches from the heel of the angle. If you had a 6 inch angle leg and only one bolt was needed in the leg, then it would be located at G equals 3.5 inches from the heel. But you could fit two bolts in a 6 inch angle leg with the first bolt located at G1 equals 2.25 inches from the heel of the angle and the second bolt located at G2 equals 2.5 inches from the first bolt. All right, so that brings us to the end of this presentation. Um, so hopefully you have an idea of the fundamental failure modes of uh, members in tension. Um, so the next step would be to work through a series of example problems to illustrate the concepts that we've tried to describe in general terms. All right, thanks a lot. We'll see you again soon.